So I know we have a very full service today. So um, it is a family service, so we are all in together. And teens, if you've been here before, you know kind of what happens now. So I'm afraid there's a little bit of musical chairs going on just quickly because I have got an activity that goes along with the sermon. So if you are an adult sitting in those rows and don't want to do the teens workshop, could I ask you, invite you to, to worksheet? Could I ask you to swap a seat with someone? If you're a teen, I can see a couple of you out there and my one's over here. Could you come and grab to the front? And just to sit over here. And then, Noel, could I ask for your help, please, just to give out some stuff? Kids. Yes, please. So could you give a clipboard? Um, and then... So each yes. Book and, uh, oh, sorry. The, the books are just so they can lean on something. Also, they're the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of those. And then can I have the pen pot back afterwards? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so, yes, I need, I need you guys... Thank you very much for being accommodating for those who've moved your chairs. Okay, so we are continuing our series of how to, and Stephen gave an excellent message last week on how to resist temptation with really, really practical tips. And I love the Bible, that the Bible is so practical and is full of lots of um, wisdom for us that we can base our life on. And now today, our message today that, um, is how to handle today's pressures and hold it all together. So how to handle today's pressures and hold it all together. And really that could be retitled to be how to be more reliant on the Holy Spirit. Because, oh, thank you so much, I'll grab. I'll need that, thank you. Cheers. And guys who's got the worksheets, as we go through, there's a couple of things that will be referenced in the sermon that will help to fill out those worksheets. And there's a, a couple of activities there as well. Okay, so how can we handle today's pressures and hold it all together? Well, if your morning was anything like mine, it was a little bit stressful. <laughs> and I came into church not feeling full of the joys of spring. And I came into church feeling quite frustrated and cross and angry and really definitely not equipped to hold everything together. Um, and as, I, as we were worshipping, as we were I was spending time in a fellowship of believers where the, that love was growing there, it really dawned on me that actually we can't hold it all together in ourselves. There are times where circumstances just kind of rear them, rear up and they become so much bigger and so much greater. And actually in our own resources, and our own strength, we cannot hold it all together. And it really reinforced to me that the only way of holding it all together is by the help of the Holy Spirit. And that is the only way, the only way. And if we can come away from this time this morning being more reliant on the Holy Spirit, knowing more of God's love for us, knowing more that actually we cannot do this walk in our own strength and that we need Jesus, if we can come away from this time knowing that and having met with God more, then that will be a success because God's heart is, is, God's heart is for us and he knows we cannot do any bit of this life by ourselves. And so often we try to. That's the difficult. We, we, we try to hold it all together in our own strength, in our own way. Even when we say, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I love God, yes, I trust in God, but gosh, we, you know that we try to hold it, do it ourselves. We have our own little pockets of pride or independence or our own little way of doing things. And Jesus wants us to know that we can't, we can't do it by ourselves. We need to do it with him. So we know that pressure comes. You know this, I know this. So for teenagers in school, you know that there'll be pressure or there could well be pressure to look good or to have the latest phone. How, you know, when an iPhone releases like the latest phone, I don't even know what the latest phone is. That's bad. I should have known this before. But um, when they release the latest phone, it's like, oh my goodness, have you got it? And if someone at school has got the latest phone, oh my goodness. And if, or to look good or to wear the branded clothes or to be thin, that's so sad, isn't it? To be thin in school is such a big thing nowadays. You know, to be, have a certain body shape, to have a certain body size. 
Um, and I think that's so much that's so much a, a symptom of our West, of our culture because in the Philippines where people are like starving and they're focused on day to day, they are not fussed about what is the image as it were. They want to have dignity, but they're not thinking, oh, I need to, you know, lose those pounds or whatever. It's about survival and eating and, and the but also the things that actually make life make sense, such as family and love and investing in others and being kind to others. Or as an adult, pressure comes. Again, the body image is one. For material wealth or success, as the world seems to say it. I saw an absolutely, or, or the right partner or spouse, I saw an absolutely terrible ad in the Philippines. And there's, it's like, this girl was saying, okay, the ideal guy, and girls, if you're single, hear this, or if you're married, you can just put your, um, your, your thoughts about this. Ideal guy is good looking, okay, fair enough. He can, he's, I won't use the word, but he can handle himself, he can fight. He's a bad, and then you can fill in the blanks there. Um, and the third one, he, can, he drives a Ferrari. <laughs> can you imagine? And this was, the, this was the TV show ad, and this was like what was being pumped out as, oh my goodness, that is success. Um, and, that's, and I was look, thinking, that's just Come on, that's ridiculous. But it's the type of messages that come out in our day to day. That, you know, they're good looking, they have a car, they have money, all of those kinds of things. How about the day to day, the, just the normal day to day pressures? Getting up, if, um, you know, getting out, paying your bills, going to work, working in possibly a really challenging environment, um, raising your kids, holding down a job, paying for the car repairs. You know, trying to make sure that you've got enough money to get through to the end of the month. You might face, they're the big things that come up, like a job loss or a marriage breakdown or the death of a loved one. Those are the big things and they can cause pressure. Or just the normal, as I said, the normal day-to-day -day things. And how about, folks, the pressure to be a good Christian? How about that pressure? When we think, actually, I feel all kinds of, horrible on the inside but I need to smile now and say yes I love Jesus and I'm fine of course I'm fine and you might be saying I'm a, a good Christian but I've just yelled at my kids or I need to be show that I'm a good Christian but I'm struggling with sexual sin I'm struggling with pornography I'm struggling with masturbation I'm having lustful thoughts about someone else um, I'm, I need to be a good Christian but I'm struggling with hatred in my heart and gossip there were all kinds of things. And so we can just sometimes think that to be a good Christian, we should never have any issues and we should always look be okay. And somehow we can always hand, hold it all together and we, can, we should never feel angry or cross or so frustrated that we could feel like we could tear our hair out. You know, to be a good Christian, we should be like this. But actually, that's, that's not the case at all. And all of that is just about doing things in our own strength by ourselves. And actually, we need God. Because to handle the pressures, we, can't, we cannot do it without him. It's a bit like, I was thinking about an illustration for this. It's a bit like taking from a bucket. If you imagined that this was you or me, and these are all the skills and the talents and differences that we, it, all the gifts and talents and energy and time and effort that we have, multicolored, varied, because we're all different and we all have different talents and skills. And we know that we've got different pots and parts of our lives, such as home or family or work or church or social groups or whatever, that we need to invest ourselves in. And so we take out from our pot and we give to those different places and we keep doing that. And, we, and for a while, it's okay. You know, I've taken some bits out here. And for the purposes of the recording, there's a bucket or there's a little tin pot with some different multicolored pens in. And I'm taking them out. And over time, we think we're okay. This is our well. This is us. And bit by bit, we just take out because we're having to invest in other places. We're having to invest in different parts of our lives. And that's good. But we're taking out from our well. And ultimately, there comes a time when there's nothing left in this pot. There's absolutely nothing left. Because we've been pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and not had God pouring in. 
Because when we try to do it by ourselves, we just keep pouring out until there's nothing left. Now, the enemy would be very happy, is very happy here, saying, you can do it by yourself. Keep going, keep pouring, keep pouring. Because the worst thing is, is that when we're pouring out, we think I'm making a difference. We think it's going to be okay. I'm going to have enough energy to keep going. I'm going to have enough energy to change things. We don't realize that bit by bit by bit, we are getting depleted until we're like that, until we're empty. Now, I very much felt like this empty pot coming in this morning because I'd got to the end of myself and I thought, I, I do not know. And yet God has been filling me up in the course of this morning. And friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you know Jesus, I do not know if your pot is a bit like this. I don't know if your pot has got lots in it or whether your pot feels absolutely empty and dry because all the pressure that comes in is just making it too much. And friends, folks, we need to get filled up, refilled by the Holy Spirit, turned again to him in order to our pot to fill up so that when we're pouring out, he's pouring in and we have something to give still. Um, and so, yeah, and so Jesus gives a really good and a very simple but hugely profound way of dealing with today's pressures. And it's a very famous passage in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. And that's Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. And it says, Come to me, all you, ho- all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, Upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, there are three things that Jesus tells us to do in that passage. Three things, and they're absolutely critical for us to be able to handle the pressure of day to day um, and hold it together. The very first thing is that we need to come to Jesus. Sounds really obvious, but we're not meant to come to ourselves. We're not meant to come to the world. We're not even meant to come to friends or family. Jesus says, come to me. And heaven knows when you're in that situation or circumstance that's been so frustrating, everything screams, go somewhere else. It doesn't scream, go to Jesus. When you're annoyed and angry and frustrated and you've just yelled or something, you're not feeling, I need to come to Jesus. But Jesus is absolutely saying, you need to come to me. And even, yeah, even if you feel that you've completely messed up, you can always and still come to Jesus. And that's the very first thing that we need to do, turning away from ourselves and turning to him. The second thing that we need to do is to take Jesus's yoke. And what that means, so a yoke in the Middle Eastern times, from what I understand, or uh, Jesus's time, sorry, is that you'd have an oxen, a big established strong ox, and then you'd have a trainee ox. And so that the trainee ox can learn from the big ox, you'd have a yoke that would kind of join the two together. It'd go over their necks and the two would go together. Um, Now, if the young trainee ox follows off where the ox go, where the big ox goes, all is well. That's fine. And the idea is that through this yoke, they will learn, the young one will learn how to go, how to plow, how to go up and down, how to do what the young ox needs to learn. And so Jesus, when he says, take my yoke, he's saying the same thing. He's saying, come away from yourself and take my yoke. So we're going to follow and walk together. And I'm going to lead you in the way that you should go. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke, it it speaks of surrender and it speaks of submission. Because um, you need to decide that I'm going to take Jesus' yoke. 
You need to decide that the pride or the independence that we all so often have, that we're going to let go of that, the self-sufficiency, the self-reliance, let go of that and take Jesus' yoke instead of our own. And that's a, an act of the will that we need to make and take. Um, and, but the, but the, there's no good if this young ox is walking alongside the big ox, but inside the young ox is going, I hate this. It's absolutely rubbish. This is such ridiculous. Oh, my goodness. This yoke is really hot and I'm heavy. I'd much rather be just drinking. Can't we just go off to the one side? If I just try and pull off to one... No, no, the big ox, is, the big ox wins because the big ox is much bigger and stronger than me. But I still hate this. It's absolutely ridiculous. Just you wait until I get out of this um, yoke and I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them what it's like. So you, you can imagine that we, we can come to Jesus. We've taken his yoke. So we're saying, okay, we're going to learn from him. But inside, there's all the rebellion, all the pride, all the self-sufficiency, all the self-reliance, all of that still stirring on the inside, and it's there bubbling and nothing's seeming to change. And so Jesus gives us the third instruction, which is absolutely critical, which is learn from me. And that's all to do with discipleship, and it's all to do with character. Learn from me. Because Jesus doesn't just want external or outside surrender. He doesn't just want our action in the right direction if our heart is completely somewhere apart from him. He wants us to know. He wants us, he wants us every single part of us, inside and out, and learn from him. And we can learn lots of things from Jesus, huge amounts. It says he's gentle and humble in heart. Now, how many of you know if you're cross and offended, you don't want to be gentle and humble? <laughs> you want to prove your point. You want to say, no, I'm absolutely right and you are wrong and that's that. The idea of being gentle or humble is actually really, really difficult. But it's really, it's really safe and it's really, it helps us to grow. Because... The opposite of being gentle and humble is to be harsh and to be proud. And now, many of us might admit that we're not gentle and humble, but many of us might not admit that we can be harsh and proud. I know I can be harsh and proud on the inside. And you might also recognize that actually sometimes you can be harsh and proud. And it might come out in little ways, just in the terms of how you think about someone else or what you think about, yeah, what you think about someone else or the way of the world or just how you are being in, in your being, as it were. And, and the downside of being harsh and, proud, pr harsh and proud is that it takes us away from Jesus. If I'm the young ox and I'm harsh and proud on the inside here, nothing's changing on the inside it's, it's a bad place to be, and it leads to isolation, it leads to judgment of others, and, and we go further and further away from God's heart. And so that's why Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. The gentleness and humility, that is our protection. And that's how we grow as disciples of Jesus. And then we can and get to that point of knowing um, how to handle life's pressures when it all just seems too much. I was reading earlier in the week, been reading through the New Testament as a church. I don't know where everyone else is at, but I'm reading chronological version of the Bible. So it's going through different things. And I just got to the fact, the point where Jesus was crucified, was being crucified on the cross. And he's just suffered the most torturous experience. He's been beaten, you know, with... with um, leather and wood and bits of metal and he's, his body is in a terrible state and then he's been made to walk through, the, um, through Jerusalem and being jeered and shouted at again and again and then last but not least he's crucified and dropped into the, the crucifixion hole as it were, as it were um, excruciating pain and suffering and I know that if I was in that place, I would want one kind voice, just one kind voice to say, I'm with you. One kind voice. And all you get instead is that the two people either side 
mocking and jeering. And then I know there's a change on one of them a bit later, but in this bit in Matthew, you get them mocking and jeering and shouting at Jesus, or not shouting, but, you know, making fun of him. You get all the chief priests or chief priests and the elders walking in front of Jesus and making fun of him. Oh, look, you saved others. Now look, you save yourself. You said that you could build this, um, rebuild this temple in three days. Come down now, prove it, and then we'll believe in you. And that's what's happening to Jesus. And I, I would have so wanted that one kind voice, but there was no kind voices. As Jesus hung on the cross, there was no kind voices. But how did Jesus stand that? How did he handle that pressure? Because I don't know if I could have done that. I don't, I don't think I could have done that in my own self. And the only way that Jesus handled that pressure is that he tuned into the Father's voice. He knew the Father's voice more than any other voice. So even though all of this stuff is going on around him and it's painful and it's horrible and it's tearing him apart, he knew the Father's voice. He focused on the Father's voice and it gave him the strength to stand. And it says later in scripture, it talks about that he, his mind was on what he would what he would achieve through the cross, not the immediate circumstance. He scorned the shame of the cross. And so often when we are in circumstances and it feels too much, we're just, we've, we've lost sight of the, the end game. We've lost sight of the end goal. We might have lost sight of tuning into the Father's voice. And so we need to almost come away and ask God to help us to tune back in to the Father's voice, help us to come back to knowing the long term that we're going towards, which is to be like you, Jesus. And these circumstances, they're temporary. The suffering is temporary. It will not last forever. And that's, folks, how we are to handle today's pressures and hold it all together, knowing that we absolutely cannot do it by ourselves. We just can't. It's impossible. We cannot. We have to be reliant on the Holy Spirit. We have to come to Jesus, not ourself, not the world, not friends, family, but to Jesus. We have to take his yoke and then we also have to learn from him. And that's what will enable us to face the shame, to face the pain, to be like those who Vicky shared about who are in, who are facing horrific circumstances but that will enable us to stand in circumstances like that and still declare that Jesus is Lord and not give it up so that my brothers and sisters is the message for today praise God wow it's very